in exchange for the three Cuban agents. Cuba today released one of the most important intelligence agents that the United States has ever had in Cuba and who has been imprisoned for nearly two decades. This man, whose sacrifice has been known to only a few, provided America with the information that allowed us to arrest the network of Cuban agents that included the men transferred to Cuba today. The convenient front used for the American change of relations with Cuba was the freeing of a government subcontractor who had spent the last five years in a Cuban prison after being uncovered by their government as an American spy. Of course, we never fall for the PR release and seek to find out the facts behind the story. To do so here, let's welcome back former CIA operative and intelligence expert Gary Bernson to bring some reality to the conversation. Gary, good to see you again. Pleasure to be with you today, Ed. Gary, the gentleman's name is Rolando Saraf Trujillo, which apparently is the name that has now leaked and that he was the actual key to all this. Can you, what do we know about who he is, what he did, and why it was so important, his mission, indeed, his original mission? Well, what I would say is this, is that the United States government has been running sources inside of Cuba for a number of years that we've attempted to learn the, the plans and intentions of the Cuban government. And any of our sources, as the man that you gave uh, earlier, you know, that would be the ultimate goal for the United States because Cuba was not only running operations inside the United States that we were trying to learn about, learn running double agents at us, but the Cuban government, the DGI, their intelligence service, and their covert action people, the PCCID, People's uh, Party of Cuba, uh, Communist Party of Cuba International Department, we're running conflicts in Latin America. We're overthrowing governments. So the struggle between the United States and Cuba was something that that was a it was a continuation of what happened in the Cold War. But the Cubans were undermining democracy across Latin America and working against American interests across this hemisphere. This was part of the struggle and all of the sources. And you mentioned the name here a minute ago, and I don't want to provide specifics on any potential case, uh, even though it's been made public. But this is what this struggle has been about. We do want to make the point here that we're not just giving something out here that has been unverified. This is out in the right. Washington Post, and this came from a U.S. official, the name of this gentleman involved. But let's look at the deal itself. This has been called one of the most significant spy swaps in recent memory, and this comes four years after the exchange of these sleeper agents with Russia. Is this indeed significant, and why? Well, it's 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 significant for the United States because we've we've released a number of individuals that were involved in active planning in the United States, and several of them were were resulted their intelligence collection activities resulted in the death of some Americans. You know, uh, but the the reality here is is I have no problem with a trade of intelligence officers for intelligence officers. They arrested Mr. Gross, who was not an intelligence operative. The other gentleman that you mentioned was. Uh, uh, an intelligence operative, uh, uh, clearly a, a source of, of, of the U.S. But the reality is, is we've given the Cubans so much more. We've given them normalization. We've given them a lot and and um, a, a whole lot. And, and it doesn't look like a very good negotiated deal for the U.S. because Cuba has consistently worked against the U.S. and our efforts to build free democratic governments across Latin America that were free market based. That's the bigger story as I see it. Remember, they put in their own guy uh, in Bolivia, Evo Morales. They put in Mujica down in Uruguay, the president down there, who was a Tupamaro. He's a member of a terrorist organization. They've supported the FARC, uh, the, the, the leftist narco traffickers in Colombia. Anytime anyone was injured, they'd, they'd take them across the border into Venezuela and fly them to hospitals in Cuba. I mean, the Cubans have supported terrorism, left-wing criminal activity, they, they, they realized that, and, and here's what happened. When, when the Cubans went into Central America years ago in the 1980s and 1990s, the United States went with the CIA and special forces and beat them back. So what the Cubans did was they changed their tactics, they switched over to the political process, and they overcame the political process by seizing control of left-wing political parties in, in Latin America with murder, mayhem, money, the whole thing, you know, press articles, they seized the left and they defeated the U.S. and the left in a number of those countries, not with terrorism, but by illegally and in many ways consuming the political and assuming the political process. I've only got about 15 seconds left. Quick answer. We'll talk more after the break. So do you then think that our intelligence efforts will get better now if we open up a embassy and we're actually on the ground in some sort of a quote unquote official capacity? No, they won't get any better because this is a uh, an absolute police state. 
I expect no changes from the Cubans. They stated, yes, we'll let the internet in, we'll do this or that. They're not going to do any of it. This is an authoritarian government. The only way they can stay in power is with complete uh, a, a complete control, and it's a police state. Okay, hold on to that. Gary Bernson, stay with us after a short break. We dive into the little man in North Korea and how he and his cohorts brought America to its knees because of a movie. Welcome back to Midpoint. Former CIA operative and intelligence analyst, also part of Concerned Veterans of America. It's a pleasure to welcome Gary Bernson back to the show. Gary, let's clean up the Cuba thing here real quickly with regard to what action the president took. In your opinion, then, does it weaken our intelligence any? Does it help us any with regard to stopping much of the crime that you just talked about that Cuba's involved in? It, I don't think it will help us in the least. It will enrich the Cuban leadership because as tourists come in, they own the hotels, their military owns the hotels. I don't see this as helping the people very much and, and um, we're not in a position to sort of leverage this to sort of for, for, for great effect. This has been a very bad deal. There's a thinking process here that this was the time to pull the trigger. Of course, many Cuban Americans we've spoken to said, wait three months, wait four months. This would have happened on its own. But there's others saying that this goes back a year and a half. This didn't just happen overnight, that Raul Castro has been doing this for some time. It was his only way out because of what's happening in Venezuela. Their money is drying up. So indeed, there are those saying, shut it off, wait, and it all would have worked itself out. But Gary, I ask you this with other people saying, 54 years and it hasn't worked. So why would we think that it would work in another couple of months? Well, let me just say this. The pressure that we put on them has worked. Where they were doing military campaigns against us in Central America and terrorism and all these other things in other places, it's reduced. If you go back to the 19, late 1970s, the Cubans were on the ground with military forces in Angola, in Mozambique, in Ethiopia. They were out there side by side with the Russians attempting to overthrow our system. They have now been reduced to a banana republic. And I don't think that we needed to do much more to help them. We should have just waited. Is the president, in your opinion, then, and others somewhat foolish for this? Makes him look rather foolish in basically going up and kowtowing to Raul Castro? He looks weak in this. And, you know, the, the president had an ideological reason for doing this, but we got nothing in return. All right, two other things that catch us now when it comes down to intelligence, what's happening around the world. First of all, in Russia. Uh, as a matter of fact, I read today that Google is now worth more than the entire Russian stock market. Their dollar is plummeting. They're in big trouble now. Is there a concern on the intelligence community's side of things that maybe Putin might start selling nukes, start selling weapons, might actually become a bigger monetary player in other countries? I don't think he would do that, but let me just say this. This is very dangerous, what's happening in their economy. And, 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 and there's no way that Putin would be selling nukes, but I would say this, that Putin, if his con economy continues to deteriorate, and if we take further actions against him, and he has nothing to lose, it may incentivize him to act in uh, possibly against the Baltic states. Because we're not going to go to nuclear war over this. He won't believe that. And if he thinks he has nothing to lose, he could park several divisions in one of those states, like Estonia, Latvia, or uh, Lithuania, and the U.S. would be very hard-pressed to stop him. But are we then it's caught in the middle here? Because we really can't sit here and prop him up. We can't give him money and make his economy it, any stronger. I think we need to get him to the table as quickly as possible, because you don't want to destroy the Russian economy in the process of this. We need a negotiated settlement on the Ukraine. And, uh, and, and the sooner we do that, the better, because if their economy becomes, if it, if it starts to collapse, it becomes dangerous for everyone. All right, let's go ahead and then look at North Korea. Quite frankly, Gary, let's speak plainly. Did America get caught with its pants down here and we weren't ready? We could have prepared. We didn't because now we have a bunch of computer hackers. It is indeed state-sponsored terrorism and we weren't ready to defend ourselves. Well... You know, the, there, there's a great book written a couple of years ago called Cyber War by Dick Clark, the former National Security Council chief of counterterrorism, where he talked about the United States having an excellent offense but horrible defense. We need to defend the grid in the United States, electric grid. We need to defend the Internet. Along the Internet, there's a spine in the United States. We need to put defense in there. But in America, where private enterprise is separate from government, there's a gap there. There's a gap in coverage, and we in the government can't convince private sector and compel them to, to, to do more on their security. 
it will change the dynamics going forward of film, political films, uh, and uh, clearly Sony buckled under this. And uh, I agree with the president's statements that people should just go to the movies. Are we they almost getting to the point? Are we almost getting to the point right now where we're going to let North Korea and others censor our films and our entertainment? That's what Sony has just done. With Sony doing that, what's the message? Thirty seconds that we send to other nations about willing to bend over. That we are easy to blackmail. That is the message they have just sent. And, uh, and the president's statement is that they shouldn't bend, that we should put this out, everybody should go to the movies, that every theater in the country should show it simultaneously, uh, but they're not going to do that. Uh, Sony is on its heels because of the release of the emails. They just want to move on from this program, this, uh, this problem that they've got as quickly as possible. In just 10 seconds, there was no intelligence that indicated that this was going to be any sort of a great terrorist attack because of this movie, was there? Uh, I don't think so. Look, the North Koreans can do the hacking. They have an awful intelligence service. They're good at kidnapping people from the shores of Japan and bringing them back and making them slaves to teach their intelligence service, English and Japanese. But their global reach is not very good. Very good. Go. service is awful. Make that the last word. Gary Bernson, thanks so much for joining us, my friend. We'll talk soon. Great pleasure, Ed. Short break and Midpoint continues.